okay, so you've got me for about three quarters of an hour, and you should have all the notes there. Um, there's loads more I could say than, than we've got here, but um, I'll just try and give you an overview and some understanding and some pointers where you can find more information. Now, is that volume okay for everybody? Sounds quite loud to me, but maybe that's good. <laughs> okay. So firstly, why do we need to understand the physics of cardiac CT? Um, I'm sure a lot of you threw it away perhaps many years ago, although I think perhaps if you're interested in cardiac CT, then you're interested in technology and, and physics to some extent. But it's mainly to, to enable you to understand how to perform the scan in the right manner. It's also so that you can uh, have some idea about how to obtain diagnostic quality images and not just rely on the manufacturer and the settings on the scanner. It's also to enable you to use as, as little radiation dose as you, as you need. Cardiac CT has a huge potential for giving uh, large radiation doses, and that was an area of concern many years ago. Um, but the techniques today do allow us to scan at very uh, significantly lower doses. And also, by understanding the different CT technologies, it helps you when you're purchasing a new scanner. And there's some good references um, that I've uh, put at the end of this talk. So just to, um, just to introduce it really, Godfrey Hounsfield, who's a, a UK engineer, he invented clinical CT in 1971. And together with Alan Cormack, a mathematician from South Africa, they were awarded the 1979 Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology. And in the 1st of October 1971, the first patient was scanned in a hospital in London. And in his speech in 1979, he, I mean, this image looks really terrible compared to what you're used to looking at. But uh, he said that a further promising field may be the detection of the coronary arteries. And it may be possible to detect these on the special conditions of scanning. I mean, such vision at that time when he just invented the ability to do cross-sectional imaging and it, it, its first um, terrific response was actually in, in the he, uh, scanning of the head, but to then to be able to say that we might be able to see the coronary arteries was amazing. And obviously there's no comparison with the images you're seeing today. Well, there's a number of things I want to go through. Uh, the scanner technology, just a quick touch on how the CT images are, are created, some comments about spatial resolution, and then very specifically for cardiac imaging, uh, how do we get good temporal resolution? Uh, bound into that is ECG gating, and then looking at single heartbeat volume imaging. Uh, well, you all know the challenges. You've got tiny vessels. You've got tiny vessels moving in three dimensions moving at supposedly a, in a regular fashion, but obviously not really specifically, terribly regularly, on, particularly on ill patients. And what you want to do is achieve the best images possible. So two requirements for cardiac CT are spatial resolution and temporal resolution. They're very important. So looking at the scanner technology, um, you have a number of slice scanners. Really, anything above 64 slice scanning is suitable for cardiac CT. You can do general CT scanning with a 32 or 16 slice scanner. But really, anything 64 slices and above is best for cardiac. And also, there's the opportunity to use single x-ray tube or dual x-ray tube. Now, this is um, a table. And you'll find a much more comprehensive one in one of the references just to show you that the, all the manufacturers offer some combination of high slices or the Siemens, the, the dual x-ray source. One of the things I'm going to comment about is to make sure you're talking about detectors or images, detector slices or image slices, and there can be a difference. So when you're looking to buy a scanner, make sure you know what 160 slice means. Is it 160 detectors in the z-axis, that's the slices, or 160 images, and it might only be um, half of that, or say the 128 slice, it might be 64 detectors, but 128 image slices. Okay, I'll probably completely confuse you, but just hold on to that for a moment. So this says um, it's a modern CT scanner. Actually, it's not a modern CT scanner, because that is not a 
70 centimeter bore, but just imagine, because it's got similar components. So you've got an aperture in the middle, all of them are 70 centimeters or, or above now. You've got an X-ray tube here and an array of detectors in an arc. And that is the construction for the modern CT scanner. And you have a fan beam of X-rays. Um, and this is your scan plane, uh, your X, Y axis, and, and along the patient is called your Z axis. And normally there's about a thousand detector elements in this arc. Now you can see here um, that this is in a this is an X-ray tube and detectors. This is the inside of the scanner, uh, ramping up to rotate at about half a second per rotation. Actually, it doesn't look that scary on there, but when it's sort of full, fully blown up, and if you're standing in the middle of that room, it would be very scary. It's very fast, and the safest place is to be the patient if on the inside, because anything that flies off would go outside. You can see it's, <laughs> it's in the factory. You've got a cage here. And if I had the sound on, you would hear some children in the background. So I think an engineer went in at the weekend to, to film this. But um, for cardiac scanning, you're looking at faster than, than uh, half a second per rotation. And these are the fastest minimum rotation times that you'll get on all the scanners today. Fastest is half a second per rotation. And that's one of the things you need for cardiac imaging, which I'm sure you can well appreciate. Um, and the, the way to this is achieved, oh, I just went back, to get that going round and round and round, it's a bit like a washing machine, apparently. And we've got um, on the gantry here, so this is very old because actually you don't now have all these cables, but on this gantry, you've got uh, a whole ring of, of uh, a very shiny metal a conductor and you've got these slip that so they're called the slip rings you've got these brushes and it it slides over maintaining a constant um, uh, electrical contact and similarly on this scanner it's a different one it's over the top of the, the gantry and so it just allows it all to run around in one direction and providing the electrical signal as well for the current and voltage to the uh, to the volt uh, to the x-ray tube and also the signal back from the detectors so this is an X-ray tube. I'm really not going to say very much about it, except they're very heavy duty in, in cardiac CT because you're having to um, use high powers uh, at long scan times very often uh, for conventional CT and also for cardiac CT. And what you've got is your, ele your electrons are heated up here from the filament. They hit the rotating anode here. The electrons hitting there generates the X-rays. Your patient is along this this z-axis um, and they're, they're just very very heavy duty they have massive cooling rates to get rid of the heat that's generated so here's here's this is a modern scanner so here's your x-ray tube and now in the third direction in the z-axis direction we've got these number of rows of detectors so from the side view we saw an arc of detectors of, of about uh, a thousand detectors and now this is our number of rows so when we talk about multi-slice detectors we're talking about these rows of detectors it's really an array of of detector elements and they're made of a number of different materials uh, designed to give a high uh, conversion from the photons fitting them uh, hitting them into the electrical signal um, there are two ways of scanning <clears throat> One is that the patient can lie in the center and everything is stationary apart from the rotational bit and the detectors uh, measure the number of photons that have gone through the patient and you can come up with um, a measure of the attenuation, how much the patient has blocked the x-rays and each, each detector element will do that. And that will rotate round, then the patient will move through and then there'll be another rotation round. Another way of scanning is in helical scanning where the couch which you see down here runs through at a constant speed and the tube and detectors continue spinning round and the detectors are acquiring attenuation data continuously and then there's a reconstruction process. I do apologise, I did have a couple of good slides on that and I must have missed them out. But I hope that description will give you some idea of what's going on. Um, if we look at the typical detector length, so this is along the patient length, we're talking about 40 millimetres, anything between 20 and 160 millimetres, but you're really, for cardiac, you're looking at 40 millimetres. And these detector elements 
are about half a millimeter uh, in, in thickness. And as I said, there's a number of detector rows. Okay, so the detector length affects your coverage of the patient per rotation of the tube and detector um, of, of the gantry. And these detector elements, they determine your, your finest slice thickness. So I told you before that there's a detector element thickness and then an image slice thickness. Well, the detector thickness does determine your final um, thinness of your image slice. So if I show you this on a cross-sectional view, so this, of course, is grossly exaggerated. Uh, so this is a G Lightspeed 64 scanner. This is 40 millimeters, so it's, it's not even covering the whole of the heart, but just for schematic view, we'll look at it like this. With 64 detector rows, so a side view, we've got 64 detector elements. Each of these are 0.625 millimeters. So we can acquire the attenuation data on each of the detector elements, um, we can acquire 64 slices of image data. So this detector element is measuring the number of photons that have gone through the patient. There will be quite a lot stopped. Um, and uh, we can measure an attenuation profile for all of these. So we can measure that for 64 different rows, or we can add the signals together and we now have 32 detector rows, and each doubling of the elements is giving us um, a 1.25 millimeter slice. And similarly, we can acquire only 16 uh, slices of data, and now these will be representing uh, tissue thickness or detector a summation of the detector elements of 2.5 millimeters. Now that's uh, very handy if all you want to do is look at 2.5 millimeter slices, but in cardiac CT you really should be acquiring at this level. And if you acquire at this level, you can then subsequently add neighboring slices together to give you thicker slices or your reconstruction at different angles, but in different thicknesses and different angles, but really you should be acquiring at your thinnest detector element available. And so really, this is just a, a summary slide that to remind you that the minimum slice thickness is your detector acquisition width. And if you acquire thick, you can only reconstruct thick slices. So your thickness of your slice is shown here. But if you acquire thin, you can reconstruct thin or you can then subsequently add them together. So you can reconstruct thick or thin. Okay, now... I'm now going to confuse you, because I'm, but this is uh, an aspect of technology, particularly with semen scanners, and I think GE does it as well. But the number of slices, and in fact, Toshiba do it as well in, in some of their scanners, the number of image slices may be greater than the number of detectors. Okay, so now on this scanner, we've got 32 detector rows, so 32 detector elements. Um, but because of a way to move the focal spot as the tube and detectors are going around the patient, we can, in essence, acquire 64 different image slices or data slices. Um, so if this, I don't know if you can see this, so the tube, the focal spot is oscillating backwards and forwards as that tube and detector is going in and out of the plane of, of the screen. So as the tube and detectors are rotating around the patient, the focal spot is rapidly, you know, in terms of uh, milliseconds, flicking backwards and forwards. And each attenuation path is slightly different. So that is called 64 slices of data that's acquired, even though it's only 32 <coughs> detector elements. Okay? And uh, if you... In theory, you can only reconstruct in an axial plane at 0.6 millimetres, but when you throw all that in together into the three-dimensional reconstructions that you've been looking at, you're essentially being able to pull out 0.3 millimetres uh, worth of spatial resolution, so there is an advantage. Now, this is a Siemens um, 
earlier scanner. So this is a 32 slice detector, but they call it a 64 slice scanner because it's a 64 slice data acquisition system. Um, now, 32 times 0.6, if you're looking at the detectors, that's 19.2 millimeters. That's actually not that long for cardiac scanning. But some of the more recent uh, Siemens scanners, for example, the definition flash and the, and the definition force, got 64 by 0.6, which is giving us a 38.4 well, millimeter detector, total detector length. So that's much better for covering the, um, the heart. And the force, now there's an error on your handout, that's not 91 rows, that's 96 rows. Um, and that gives us nearly 60 millimetres of coverage. Now, so those are 64 and 96 detector rows, and they're termed 128 slice scanner or 192 slices. So you just have to be careful when you're buying a scanner to know whether you're looking at detector rows or number of slices. And then also look at the coverage, because that's going to affect how many times you have to scan down the heart, and that affects the ultimate image quality. So, for example, there's an Atiba 160 millimeter uh, single array, and that will do the heart in one go. Obviously, with these, you have to do them in stages. Okay, so on the next slide is just another illustration. This is 64 slice scanners. The two, the G and the Siemens, are termed 128 slice scanners. Um, and the bottom two are term 64 slice. Actually, they've all got very similar coverage except for the, this particular Toshiba one. Now, in one of the references, and I won't stop here, but it, this reference I've put in the slides, and it's also similar to what you have in your handouts. It's from the same people, but I can give you the website later. But this gives you all the information you need about the modern um, systems that are available for cardiac scanning and this was this came out earlier this year so this is the best source that you can find to find all those little details and there's a very good paper very good and two very good reports and I'd urge you to look at them so um, so that's our sort of learning points one we've looked at some of the technology we've um, um, uh, We've looked at the two main components, the detector thickness and the number of detectors, looking at the total coverage, looking at our minimal slice thickness, and also that the number of detectors is not necessarily equal to the number of slices. So now I'm going to talk about the creation of the CT image. So I've talked about the measuring the attenuation for each detector element, we're measuring the attenuation of the X-ray beam. So if we just look in the cross section, this is our attenuation profile. So this is, is um, representing the stopping power, if you like, of the object that's in the, in the way of that X-ray beam. And each element here is defined here to give us the points on the curve. Now the tube and detectors, as you saw earlier, rotate round very rapidly. And these detectors sample very, very quickly and because of the material of the detectors, they reset very quickly as well. So we're talking about milliseconds. And actually, in a single rotation, like that half second, you're perhaps getting a 1,000 angular projections. This just shows typical projection at the 90 degree position. So you've got much more attenuation going through sideways through the patient. And the key for reconstruction is how you unravel all those attenuation profiles. Now, I mentioned about, if I, sorry, if I just go, oh. I go back, right, go back and I go forward, where am I going, that's right, so that, so in, um, sorry, I mentioned earlier that there's axial scanning and helical scanning, so axial scanning, the couch is stationary, and the tube and detectors rotate in one position, so you've got very simple, um, <coughs> relatively, procedure for then unravelling these attenuation profiles, but a lot of scanning happens with helical scanning, and as I said, that's where the couch moves forward, to, forward in a constant speed and the tube and detectors just carry on rotating and the detectors carry on acquiring. And then what happens is that you might have an attenuation profile through the patient at one position and then once the tube and detectors have rotated around they're actually at a different <coughs> z-axis position and what you might want is the attenuation profile halfway through there and really it's just a matter of interpolation of the two profiles. Um, Okay, 
And the advantage of helical scanning is that you can then reconstruct at any position because you're doing some interpolation. It's not quite so relevant for cardiac in one sense, um, but there's a lot more flexibility with helical scanning. There's a trade-off between helical and axial scanning in cardiac, and a lot of it is axial scanning just for the dose reduction aspects. Okay, another factor to consider is that uh, whether you're going um, through the whether the X-ray beam is going through the patient in one direction, you're still going to get exactly the same attenuation, net attenuation, as if you're going uh, if the X-ray tube is in, in the completely opposite direction and uh, go, the beam is is going through the patient in the other direction. So you can have attenuation profiles that are exactly the same, and these are called complementary projections. And the reason for, for me emphasizing this is that in cardiac CT, when time is, is the essence or shortness of time, very often only one, um, only half of that complete rotation is used to reconstruct the image. Okay, um, one thing I'm just going to throw out to you is the sinogram. So if you're reading papers, uh, the sinogram is taking those attenuation profiles and visualizing them on a grayscale and then putting them all on one image. And this is your sinogram, and that contains all the information that is required to reconstruct the image. And here is the attenuation profile through the 90 degree position here, um, uh, showing that you've got a shorter distance. That's all I'm going to say on that, just to uh, park it in your brains, really, when, when you're looking at papers. Now, in terms of image reconstruction, as I said, what we want to do is to unravel those attenuation profiles. And really, I'm just going to give you a top-level view here. There are some analytical techniques. Um, there's a two-dimensional filter back projection for slices up to about 12. There's techniques to overcome cone beam artifacts. Um, and cone beam artifact it's where you've got that, um, uh, you've got a wide detector array, so 40, 160 millimeters, and um, uh, the, I probably should show it really. Okay, so here, the, the beam, the projection back from this detector element back to the focal spot is at an angle. And that creates problems when you're trying to reconstruct. So the longer the detectors, the more you're going to get cone beam artifacts. So special ways of reconstructing the images is required. Okay. Um, and then and then you have to go to complete cone beam reconstruction. Now there's another um, sort of in parallel to that, you've got iterative reconstruction, which is completely different from analytical techniques. And these are what you'll find on the modern scanners, and these are some of the manufacturer's names. And they're all about reducing the dose or making more use of the attenuation information so you have potential to reduce the dose. OK, so let's have a quick look at simple back projection. So this is the, um, I'm just looking at the analytical techniques. I'm looking at sort of a stage before the filter back projection. So we've got our attenuation profiles here. Um, if we take the attenuation profile and map it back into our image space, this is our object, we don't know what this object is, but we have measured an attenuation profile. So we take a guess and we say, well, there's an object completely filling the image space. And then we take the other one and we say, well, we know in this direction there's an object that will give us this certain attenuation profile and we'll assume it's completely filling the, the image space. And when you smear them backwards, when you back project, you find that they're crossing over in the point of, and the point of intersection is where your object is. That's sort of it very simplistically. And if you add on all those projections, you can see that more and more you're getting uh, a definition of the original object. Now the problem is with simple back projection, and these are sort of, this isn't used, but it's just to take you through the process, is you get a lot of blurring. So what we need to do is to filter um, the back projection so that we can clear up those edges a little bit. And um, so filter back projection is where, as I said, these original projections are modified to give us the sharper image. And if this is an attenuation profile, the actual profile, and then in yellow it's the filtered one where we've just sharpened up 
in each of those attenuation profiles. Um, and uh, this is a schematic sh view just showing what would happen if you didn't do the filtering, and this is what happens if you do. Once you've done the filter back projection, you then get the images that you can see today. Um, so one of the reasons I'm talking about the filtering part of it, because that's what's used, is that you have some choice on your scanner in terms of what filter is applied. So you can apply uh, a smooth filter or a sharp filter, and that will affect how the final image will look. Um, so this is your unfiltered projection that we were looking at before, and now we've filtered, we've sharpened up the edges, but you have a choice. And um, smooth, here we have two filters. So these are cho chosen by you or chosen by the radiographer or at the machine. Uh, you have a smooth filter here, so it hasn't sharpened up the edges terribly much, enough for you to see what's in the image, but still keeping some of the noise down. The problem with using sharper filters is that you have higher noise, but you do get much higher spatial resolution, much higher definition. And so for cardiac imaging, what are you going to do? Well, this is very good paper. Um, so you might want to use some wider uh, slices and a medium smooth filter, where you're looking at perhaps some of the soft tissue definition, but really if you're wanting to sharpen up some of your stents, then you'll be going for a sharper filter. So I talked about iterative reconstruction. Iterative reconstruction is a whole huge topic in itself, but every scanner will offer it. Um, the main thing is that there's a number of ways of doing it, and the, the original way is to take your filter back projection process um, so sorry. So this is your normal filter back projection. You've done your reconstruction, you've back projected, you filtered it, you've got your CT image. And then you take the CT image and you essentially sort of pretend scan it again, if you like, and you take some fresh attenuation profiles from that image. And then you can, so it's called forward projection, and you compare it with the actual attenuation profiles or the raw data that you got the first time when you actually scan the object, and then you make some correction and then you iterate, iterate round until you find um, you're getting, um, getting to a point of convergence. And this is, using up, this is using more of the information. And as I said, it's a whole topic in itself. And this slide just shows you that each manufacturer has a number of different methods. And some of these methods on the right, which is so-called model-based iteration, they're very computer intensive, but they're, um, they give you much better results in many ways. Um, and so there's this, this constant balance between whether you wait 20 minutes for a very, very good image, which is what some of the early, state, early versions of these uh, versions of the software did, or whether you're happy to stay back in this level. Okay, now one of the advantages, as I said, by using more of the data, you're reducing the noise in the image. So this is the same scan. <coughs> this is on filtered back projection, and this is on iterative reconstruction. So you've got much less noise. Um, and if you wanted to lower the dose, if you, say, thought that this noise was acceptable, you could then decrease the tube current. Um, and so you have options for improving image quality or lowering your dose when you use iterative reconstruction. And um, here are just some other examples. This one in the right has um, lower tube current, it's got the same noise, but it's actually got less artifacts, so it actually looks smoother as well. Okay, I think I need to quickly move on. <laughs> um, so spatial resolution, we can talk about spatial resolution in the z-axis or the scan plane. So I think I've added this bit on the right because I just, from your notes, so I want you to realise that you can... These are test object images, but you can do that whether you're looking at images uh, in multiplanar format along the z-axis or in the, in the scan plane. And really you're looking at your three-dimensional uh, view of, of spatial resolution. And uh, there's paper here referenced. Uh, <coughs> let's just quickly look at this. So our, when we look at our, our cross-sectional slice, the length of our cross-sectional slice, or of our voxel, is our image slicing. So we talked about that earlier. And our pixel size in the scan plane 
is the field of view that you will have scanned at divided by the matrix, which is usually 512 by 512, or it might be 1024 by 1024. Uh, okay, so I've added in a couple of extra things on your notes as well. The fact is determining spatial resolution, not just the detector size and the matrix in the field of view, but also the sampling rate and the, re and the reconstruction filter, because I mentioned that earlier. And then along the z-axis, we're talking about this slice collimation, the slice thickness, and the detector size again. So detector size in both dimensions is important. Okay, one thing you perhaps need to be aware of is with the field of view. So on the left, we've got a 350 millimeter field of view. So regardless of what the intrinsic spatial resolution of your scanner is, you know, it might have really fine detectors, um, you are reconstructing that 350 millimeters. So it's, it's, it's 350 by 350 um, over 512 pixels. So each pixel size is 0.68 by 0.68 millimeters. So that's all you're going to see because fundamentally 350 millimeters distributed over 512 pixels is going to give you that value. So probably what you want to do to match the spatial resolution of the system is to do a reconstruction at a smaller field of view, say 250 millimeters. Now you could go down to 100 millimeters and that will give you pixel sizes of 0.2 millimeters that may take you less than the intrinsic resolution of the system, so you may just not be gaining anything. But it's just something to be aware of. Certainly if you want high resolution, you won't be able to see it at 350 millimeter field of view. Okay, so what you want for cardiac imaging is ideally isotropic spatial resolution at less than one millimeters. Okay. So, You've got a table there that looks at modulation transfer functions. Well, I, I did put a little bit more on about that, and we can come back to that, but I think I'm going to move on to... Um, there's a table comparing the different spatial resolution for the different um, cardiac imaging modalities. And cardiac CT does very well compared to MRI and, and SPECT. And okay, but let's move on. Um, you, with spatial resolution and the reconstruction filters, uh, there's always this play, uh, um, this trade-off. Now, one thing with imaging stents is that you get a lot of this blurring, and I, and I showed you earlier that actually you need to have a, an increased spatial resolution by using your sharp filter, and then you can get to much better spatial resolution. Okay, well, it's, we've done all that, so... I'm running a little bit behind time, but let's move on to the specifics on temporal resolution, ECG gating, and single heartbeat volume imaging. So the whole thing about cardiac imaging is you want to scan something, very, scan the heart very, very quickly to freeze it in motion. Um, and what determines that is the heart rate, how fast the heart rate the heart is beating. And the faster the heart rate, the the um, quicker your shutter speed to image that, that heart. And, um, okay. So if we look at a 60 heartbeat, a 60 beats per minute standard heart cycle, and you look at your R to R of one second, what I've picked up, and I could be quite shattered down over this, but on early papers, it basically said that you're looking at um, ideally getting about 10% of your R2R -R interval for scanning. So if you're at 60 beats per minute, you're looking for 10% of that, which is 100 milliseconds. So if we start off from that, um, and we look at the scanner minimum rotation times, we know that we're already far, um, our, our rotation times are too long for us to do, be able to do a quick snapshot of 100 milliseconds. We want to freeze the cardiac motion in the phase of least cardiac motion, which is generally mid-diastole or end-systole. And so on this table, if we look at, we've got three different heartbeats, heart rates actually, 40, 60, and 120. So this is what I've already said. If we look here, we've got a typical scan with shortest rotation times, and I've just added in green, that's this seconds in milliseconds. And so we're really nowhere near what we want to image. 
I talked about the half rotation time before with the opposing projections, so I won't stop on this one. I already talked to you about that. But we can halve our rotation time and say that's going to be our imaging time. So we can now half our rotation time. This is our um, half rotation imaging time, but we're still actually not doing very well, um, apart from maybe this one, when we're trying to get our useful still time in the cardiac cycle. So our 10% of our R to R interval. Um, okay. So how can we improve the temporal resolution where well, we can reduce the heart rate, we can do faster tube rotation time, um, ECG gating, uh, we can do multi-sector reconstruction, we can use multiple tubes. So if we look at ECG gating, um, you're all be aware that you're, you're linking your patient to the um, ECG monitor, which is also linked into the scanner. And basically, you're just wanting to, to tune your scan acquisition to the patient's ECG. Um, this is just a real ECG, so it's not saying anything more than I've said already. Okay. And so we've got our systolic phase and our diastolic, which is where we want to image generally. And... Um, so there are two ways of scanning, axial scanning and helical scanning, and that's the same in cardiac. So in axial scanning, we can do something called prospective triggering, which is a bit like if you're trying to uh, image the legs of these hurdlers, you're going to take a snapshot every time they are over the hurdle because that's when their leg is stationary. The same with the heart. In the diastolic phase, your, your vessels are pretty well stationary, so that's when you're going to take your picture. Um, alternatively, you could do helical scanning and scan the whole heart cycle and then you go back and you select the images afterwards. So you can see when they're, when they're over the hurdles, the legs are stationary and that will be the best place to go back and take the image. And it's exactly the same with the vessels and the heart. Okay. So for prospective Gating. This is the step and shoot approach. We will have to take a scan at every other heartbeat, and that's because we've scanned, we move the heart, move the patient, we scan, we move the patient, we scan again. And these are fairly low doses. It's the default mode for calcium scoring, and it is the preferred approach for um, low heart rates for CT angiography. Okay, I've just showed that there to show that the tube and detectors are stationary along the z-axis in each position. Now, so this is representing half a rotation. Now, because we often want a little bit more flexibility of, of this 75% point in the heart cycle where we take the data from to reconstruct, we have something called padding. So instead of that half rotation, which I said is all we need, actually we're going to do... Uh, so the tube and detector is still going around. It's just when the, the, the x-rays are switched on. Okay? But now we're going to switch the x-rays on for more than that 180 degrees. Okay, I said we only needed 180 degrees, but now we're going to switch it on for more. So then we have a little bit more flexibility of where we select our data from in each of those scans. And that just provides the flexibility when you have your real ECGs. You know, not this superbly perfect thing. And um, so that's one approach. And prospective scanning is the least radiation dose. So the retrospective scanning, as I said, it's like you're filming the whole heart all in one go, uh, the whole cycle. Um, and because we've got a limited detector width, we have to do a helical scan. So we're moving the patient through that we schematically show it as the beam going through. So we're scanning the whole heart and at each of the heart cycles, we're picking up, oh sorry, I've gone with modulation. So let's just go back. We're scanning the whole thing and then we can take the data out at the diastole point for reconstruction. But we could actually take data out at any of the other points and that can give us the option for functional analysis. However, that's really high dose, and 15 millisieverts actually is very low. 
uh, in this slide. There are many um, examples of 30 millisieverts where um, retrospect retrospective spiral scanning was happening. This is in the early days of cardiac. So while technology in parallel allowed the prospective <coughs> scanning to take place, the manufacturers were also developing the way of lowering, lowering the tube for the parts of the heart cycle where you're not going to do any real reconstruction. You could actually still reconstruct images in this part of the heart cycle. The image quality would be poorer because you're using lower radiation dose. So this purple thing is the level of the tube current. But primarily you're looking at collecting data from this part of the heart cycle. And um, so I keep going the wrong way. That's just to show that again. And that significantly lowers the, the dose to the patient, about 30%. And it depends on your scanner very often as to which modality you use. All the newer ones you can probably do prospective. On the, some of the early 64 slice scanners, you, you might still have to do retrospective. <coughs> and also it depends on the complexity of your patient. I'm not gonna, this is just one example from GE, and I'm not going to stop on that. So uh, there are a number of ways we can improve the temporal resolution. I've sort of talked about ECG gating. And I'm just going to quickly talk about the others. So beta blockers, you'll get talks about that to reduce the heart rate for the patient. Shorten the image time. Well, you saw that on that image of the gantry rotating. Actually, technology has taken the rotation of the gantry and the tube and detectors to its fastest speed, really. But on your scanner, you will use, you, for cardiac, you'll be using the fastest rotation possible. I suspect developments won't go much further than that. And then there's multi-sector reconstruction, which all manufacturers offer. And then there's the tube-tube approach by Siemens. Okay, so let's look at multi-sector reconstruction. Now, I'm afraid I do feel I've whizzed through all this fairly quickly, but hopefully it'll be a resource for you to go back to later. So we're talking about half a rotation worth of data. So. So it's a 300 millisecond rotation in this example and 150 milliseconds of data that we're using to reconstruct our image. So that's, that's what I've been talking about. So that's single sector, okay? And, and we're getting the data from each heartbeat, which is what I was showing you. Now what you could do, and this is primarily in helical scanning, although in the Toshiba Aquilium one, you can do it in axial scanning. But in helical scanning, um, what happens when you rotate around, when, when the, the, sorry, the couch moves through slowly, you're actually getting overlapping irradiations, and you need to do that in, in cardiac scanning. So I haven't talked about the definition of pitch, but it, it's basically a very low pitch value so that the, the tube and detectors are overlapping each other while the couch moves through very slowly. And this enables us in, in cardiac imaging to take some data um, in successive rotations in the same position in the heart. Okay, so uh, what happens, this is like an example for the two sector. So we've, we've overlapped, we, in the first heartbeat, we just take a quarter of a rotation of data. And then we're, what happens is actually it's it's about three and a quarter rotations going round while you're get, waiting for the next heartbeat. So the count is moving very slowly till you get to the next heartbeat. And then you take the next quarter sector of data. So you now have enough data taken at the same z-axis position that will enable you to create an image of that slice of the heart. But each sector of data is now 75 milliseconds long. So if you've got a regular heartbeat, and so you've got good registration of those two sectors, you'll get a better image because intrinsically the temporal resolution is better. And you can do the same for three sector and four sector. Now it gets complicated then because you, for four heartbeats, you've got to make sure that the heart is going to exactly the same position. And for the ill patients, that's not really likely to happen. But here's an example of an improvement from two sector reconstruction and three, when you've gone to three sector. I could actually show you an example where it went worse because of the poor, um, of the instability of the heart rate. So it has to be used fairly carefully, but this example particularly shows an improvement 
when you've gone to this three sector where each sector is a, is is a much smaller space of time so it's a much better temporal resolution so in theory multi-sector reconstruction is good for fast heart rates but it requires a steady heart rate for good registration of, of sectors and the advantage is that it's only for specific heart rates and there's a very complex relationship between the heart rate, rotation time, the pitch, and how fast the, tube, the couch is moving, and the effect on temporal resolution. Now, fortunately, all the manufacturers, except G, calculate it for you when you, when you opt for the multi-sector reconstruction. G uh, give you guidance as to which approach to use. Okay, so, yeah, we're, yeah, we're almost out. I know you want to ask some questions. Okay. So the other way to get multi-sector reconstruction is the Siemens two-source system where um, our two sectors are taken simultaneously. So, um, so that was the flash and the force. And we'll get back on that later. But. So we've got two tubes and two detectors inside the gantry. Now if you switch on at this point, so we've only irradiated for a quarter of a sector sector and we've now but we've got from the two separate detector elements we've now got our full 180 degrees worth of, of data in just quarter of a rotation of the x-ray tube and so that means we've got the better spatial resolution in one heart rate uh, sorry better temporal resolution so sorry, in in one in one heartbeat okay so it's a huge advantage and with the three uh, Siemens systems, the best you can get down to 66 milliseconds. Um, so finally, single heartbeat volume imaging. Well, I've talked about coverage. A typical 64 slice scanner is 40 millimeters, so you might be doing three axial scans in one go. Um, and really what you want to do is to cover the heart in one beat. And in the same way with the multi-sector reconstruction, you want good registration. The same when you're scanning down the heart. With a regular heart rate, you get a nice image. But with an irregular heart rate, you might get a lot of artifact. And you can see here on some of the early, one of the early scanners, you've got a lot of misregistration. And that's what you'll see, um, this banding, if you've got poor registration. So with a 40 millimeter scanner, you'll need seven heartbeats in axial scanning because you've got to allow time to move the couch forward so you have to miss a heartbeat. Three heartbeats for an 80 millimeter and for 160 millimeter detect row one heartbeat. So it's the brilliance ICT is 80 millimeter, Toshiba Aquila one is 160 millimeter and G revolution is um, 160 millimeter as well. One final point Sorry, Taryn, <laughs> slightly uh, over. But um, so we get full organ coverage, one beat with a wide detector, but we can also get it with a very high pitch with the Siemens system. And here, instead of doing the axial scanning in the multi sector, how I showed it before, now they're using the two, two um, X ray tube and detector system, but just scanning the heart in one beat but it's over a period of 300 milliseconds so it's quite a long period of time um, and I'll just show you here so it's essentially what I showed you before but all the sectors done all in one go it's a very complicated way of dealing with all the data so the problem is that because it's a long period of time um, it's only suitable for heart rates less than 65 beats per minute but each image is very high um, temporal resolution and it's all done in one beat so you don't have the problem of registration okay well that's a whistle stop tour um, you need rapid rotation you need uh, high spatial resolution and you need fast or complete coverage of the heart to minim minimize movement artifacts these are the papers very good paper I urge you to look at that uh, it's this is the report that came out from it, and this is what I refer to. This is another report that's publicly available on the website. Um, and I'll give, if you can Google it easily, it's associated with the other two papers. This is a previous version of a uh, CTA, uh, cardiac CT comparison report, 
and then these are some websites that have very good information. So thank you very much. I'm sorry that's bombarded you with lots of information. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.